Welcome to task 4, multi-stage amplifiers and differential to single-ended output conversion. So this is essentially where you'll be designing the bulk of your operational amplifier for this project. Let's review what the uh, op-amp specifications are. The differential gain is supposed to be larger than or at least equal to 46 decibels, so 200 volts per volt. The unit gain frequency should be larger than 150 kilohertz. Now this is what it should be after the frequency compensation that you'll do in task 5 once we study feedback. We need it to be larger in task 4, so you probably should aim for something larger than 500 kilohertz hopefully. The common mode rejection ratio of your operational amplifier should be larger than 60 decibels, and it should be able to drive a 500 ohm load under small signal conditions. That is, the loaded gain should drop about 3 decibels below the unloaded gain for a 1 volt peak to peak output signal when you have a 500 long connected to it. Ideally, that load should be small. You're expected to have an infinite input resistance in your operational amplifier. So what should you do when you design your operational amplifier? The initial gut instinct of most of you will probably be to design your gain stages to obtain the highest possible gain but there are other requirements that need to be met. Keep in mind that at the very end of this project, your op-amp will be used in an oscillator circuit whose output must be 3 volts peak to peak. So that means that the op-amp will need to provide a larger output, for example, 4 volts peak to peak. The high gain also means a small FT, unit gain frequency. As we'll see in chapter 10 that we're studying now, the higher the gain for a given amplifier, the lower its 3 dB bandwidth, and hence the lower the unit gain frequency of your op amp. Common mode rejection ratio is a factor in all of this, and you must be able to drive a 500 ohm load. A large voltage gain gain stage implies a large output resistance. There are also specifications for distortion under specific measurement conditions. So how should you choose your transistor type, whether if you're going to use the ALD MOSFETs or the 2N3904 or 3906PJTs? I would start by comparing the delta VC to the delta VDS, the voltage swings that you can expect at the output. Remember that the ALD MOSFETs will require a very large overdrive voltage to conduct any significant current. The collector to emitter saturation voltage for the VJTs is less than 0.3 volts, so you should be able to get larger output voltage swings with the VJTs. You will also need smaller bias currents to achieve both high gain and to allow a large voltage swing for the MOSFETs. So smaller currents mean smaller VOVs, and keeping in mind that the transconductance drops by a factor of a square root of the bias current while the output resistance increases inversely proportional to the uh, bias current, MOSFETs, when biased with lower bias currents, will give you larger voltage gains. But this, in turn, will limit the frequency response of the amplifier, as we'll see. On the other hand, the gain of the BGT stages is essentially independent of the bias current, as both the transconductance GM and the output resistance RO change linearly with the bias current. So GM RO is constant. But larger bias currents imply a lower output resistance and a larger FT. Here's a short exercise on biasing the ALDs for specific bias currents ranging from 100 microamps to 2 milliamps. Keep in mind that the supply voltages for your op-amp are plus and minus 5 volts. Looking at this table, currents beyond 400 microamps severely limit the voltage swing of the amplifier. Another concern is bias stability. In previous years, a lot of groups managed to go above 60 decibels of gain, and at least one 2005 group reached 80 decibels gain using active loads. However, they needed potentiometers to adjust their operating points. High gain amplifiers are very sensitive to bias stability. Keep in mind a gain of 80 decibels implies that their gain stage had a gain of a roughly 54 decibels or so, so close to 500 volts per volt. For a 5 volt output, this suggests that the maximum possible input for that stage was 10 millivolts. Keeping in mind the uh, linearity of the amplifiers, they probably had a 10 millivolt input range. And if the input voltage to that stage varied, any, in any direction past that optimum stage, that amplifier simply railed. Keep in mind that the components that you have are not exactly matched very well. These are not all put on a single IC built right next to each other. And if you have, if you're using a potentiometer, a circuit that works today may not work tomorrow. 
The resistors, the transistors have different temperature coefficients for one thing. Your supply voltage limits might shift by a couple hundred millivolts. And the potentiometers are not exactly mechanically stable. They might shift by several ohms. And if your bias requires that your potentiometer is accurate down to an ohm, that could be a significant problem. So in the task manual, I've given you several examples. The first one essentially takes the differential pair that you did in task three, adds a common source amplifier to it, and then uses a class B output stage. Keeping in mind that the bias current of that PMOS P3 is the same as the PMOS P2, the gain of that second stage is nearly identical to the gain of the differential stage. The only difference here is going to be the output stage loading. RS in this circuit is a potentiometer. The purpose of that is to bring the DC output to zero volts. That is to balance N7 and P3. But in my circuit, once I built it, it reduced the gain to 11 decibels. Now keep in mind that the output resistance of the differential pair when biased with the currents from task 3 was on the order of 80 kiloohms. And you're driving a common source amplifier that has a gain of roughly 30 volts per volt. So the Miller effect is going to be significant. And if we total up all of the capacitances from P2, N2, and P3, the capacitance at that node is going to be on the order of three or four picofarads. So the frequency response of this amplifier will be limited by that node, D2. The op-amp 2 design essentially adds uh, a resistive load differential pair at the input, uses two differential pairs, and then a common source amplifier for gain. So that active load differential pair and common source amplifier are essentially from the op-amp 1 design. The resistive load differential amplifier helps with the offset voltage by making one of those drain resistors a potentiometer. We can adjust and balance the differential pairs. The output stage in this case is a class AB output stage, which has a lower distortion. In this case, transistors Q3 and Q4 draw current from the common source gain stage at all times, and that is going to impact the biasing of that gain stage. Here's an example of a dual design of what not to do. The input is again the active load differential pair from task 3. It drives a source follower, which then drives a cascode amplifier. Unfortunately, the biasing of this circuit proved to be nearly impossible, and all of this uh, effort resulted in only 40, 60 decibels of gain, not very much. The output voltage swing is very limited in the positive direction for this device, mostly impacted by the body voltages of the transistors M15, N2, and N1. That final NMOS had a threshold voltage of about 2.2 volts instead of 0.8 volts. In red are the node voltages, the DC node voltages. And uh, again, this was an overly complicated design that did not work. op 3 is essentially the active load differential pair followed by an emitter follower, which drives a common emitter amplifier. Since everything is DC biased, the final common emitter amplifier is actually has to have emitter degeneration. In this example, I'm using, again, a class B output state. The common emitter gain can easily be 50 volts per volt with a resistive load. It can even go to much higher gains with an active load. This is one example with an active load where the RC has been replaced with two PMOSs connected in parallel to be active loads for Q2. This single stage could reach 200 volts per volt or larger gain, but RE2, which was required for biasing the transistor Q2, necessarily caused the gain to be reduced, but by not too much. Here's an even better version of that amplifier where the emitter follower Q1 is now biased with a current mirror. That improves the bias voltage at the base of it and the emitter of it it allows us to control node voltages at D2 and B2 much better. Transistor Q2's load is now a 2N2906 PMP transistor, and the output stage is a class AB output stage. Without that RE2, the gain of that amplifier would have been 
a thousand volts per volt, just the Q2 to and Q7 active load amplifier. With R2 and the loading due to the class AB amplifier, the gain of that single stage was about 200 volts per volt. So overall, this amplifier had a gain of roughly 6,000 volts per volt. Now, what about the gain sensitivity to the bias values? If you look at that very last example, the gain of that stage was very, very highly dependent upon RE2 because RE2 essentially balanced the current between Q2 and Q7, made sure that they had the same collector current and that they were matched. On the other hand, only a half a volt difference could cause the output to rail on that amplifier, which, of course, is not a very good way to build an amplifier. In this case, it would be nice to replace RE2 with an active load such as Q9, a current mirror. If you look at exam 215 question 5 on the second exam on 2015, you'd see what I mean. But we cannot use a bypass capacitor for a general purpose op-amp, so that would make life more difficult for this amplifier. 